Today on Treasure Hunting America, we'll visit with Randy Smith, a man who loves hunting for Civil War relics. Every officer with every regiment was, was mandated to turn in a report every week. Where is he? What's he doing? It's not that hard to find these places. Now it's still, you've got to get out there and, and cover some ground, but once you start hitting those bullets, you know you're in the area. Then we'll travel to Fresno, California, where Phil Foster and his five-year-old son hunt for treasure in the local reservoirs. My son got to an age where he actually understood that there's metal in the ground and this machine will tell you that there's metal right there. I think he's kind of hooked too. He'll ask me uh, if we can go out pretty regularly now. And finally, we'll join Richard Brooks of Portland, Oregon, who searches for jewelry and coins in the city's old time parks. The Laurelers Park is an old Portland park. It has been hunted quite a bit, but there's still things in the ground here that have never been found. All coming up on Treasure Hunting America. Hello and welcome to this episode of Treasure Hunting America. I'm your host, Mark Hendricks. Over the next half hour, we'll share some amazing stories of everyday treasure hunters across the country. Our first treasure hunter is Randy Smith. Randy's exposure to metal detecting began by learning from his father, whose best find was a loaded 18th century Spanish flintlock pistol. This made a huge impression on Randy in what treasure lies just under the ground waiting to be found. Actually, my dad started the hobby for our family back when I was like nine years old, and he really got addicted into it, and all of our, virtually all of our vacations were, had some metal detecting involved in uh, weekends and evenings and stuff, and so I started early. I was, like I said, nine years old, and just the things that he would find would be really interesting to me, and that just kept me you know, going into it and, and staying involved with it, so it's, it's uh, been a lifelong hobby for me. It just kind of grew on me, you know, I started seeing some of the things he was finding and it was fascinating and interesting and stuff. So like father, like son, I wanted to get out there and do what he's doing. And uh, then I started finding things and it just kind of became an addic addiction from there. And uh, it's just something that I've, I, I've done always, it seems like. You're out in the outdoors and you're together. And uh, you know, if, if you have a kind of a competitive relationship with somebody, well then this is just like fishing or anything else. You want to try to outdo the next guy. So it, it just, it's real fun. Randy lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a great hunting ground for ghost towns, oil boom towns, and Civil War relics. Uh, Oklahoma area is a fantastic area for metal detecting. A lot of history, a lot of Indian history, uh, settlers, uh, the oil boom created a lot of ghost towns that uh, you know went away you know in later years. So it's a lot of opportunities for metal detecting. A lot of outlaw history where they were robbing trains and banks and and burying the money. So it's just a great historical place to metal detect as most of the country is when you think about it. For Randy, his passion for metal detecting starts first with a love of history. Old houses like this one built in 1881 is an excellent place to metal detect. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine noticed some construction out here in front and metal detected it. He found this old bust. Could be a top of a cane or a doll. We're not real sure what it is, but it's certainly an interesting item. So remember to keep your eyes open for places like this. It's an excellent place. And remember not to throw things away that you're not sure what they are. They could be valuable. I've always been interested in history. And this is basically, uh, you know, a, a, just a, a looking glass into history. Um, it's always fun for me to try to think of, well, this artifact, what is it, first of all? You know, what were the circumstances, why it's here? Who did it belong to? And it's just like a big riddle. This is a, uh, a really old park that I'm hunting and there's a lot of trash, a lot of trash in the ground. So I'm trying to pick out the, the good signals and they read higher on the screen that tells me that they're coins. And I'm gonna try to ignore a lot of the tin foil and, and bottle caps and pull tabs. And you, you know, you survey the area when you get started. You, you kind of look, well, you know, where did things happen out here a hundred years ago? You know, you look at the size of the trees 
you look at the rocks and you, you kind of visualize you know where the people congregated and that's where you want to concentrate. When we return, Randy will show some of his best Civil War finds and share about fellow treasure hunter Garth Brooks. Welcome back to Treasure Hunting America. With his residence in the Midwest, Randy Smith has wonderful opportunities to hunt for his favorite artifacts, Civil War relics. Some of my favorite metal detecting is Civil War relic hunting. What I try to do there is find out the roads and the trails where the soldiers would move up and down and of course where the forts were. But in between these forts, you know, they would move back and forth between forts and about every 13 miles, which is about as far as they could go in a day, then they would have to camp. These places on these roads became regular campsites that they would use over and over and over. So they're just loaded with artifacts, loaded with history. And relic hunting is kind of a combination of, of uh, all types of hunting because you find all types of stuff. You find coins just like a coin hunter would. Then you find the military items. You find spoons and forks and just all kinds of things, uh, old bottles and, and stuff of that nature. So they're out, usually out in rural areas, which is real peaceful and, and nobody to bother you, you know, nobody looking over your shoulder. And, and it's just real enjoyable to spend a day out there in those kind of areas. This is some Civil War bullets that this the typical finds what you might find in an old Civil War campsite, uh, you know, the bullets and the buttons and things of that nature. So this is, this is just a variety of the different types of bullets that you might find. Uh, they're not real valuable, six, seven dollars a piece. There are some rare ones that can be worth, you know, hundreds of dollars, but typically this is the kind you find. This here is a uh, exploded Civil War cannonball, and uh, I found this at the Battle of um, Cabin Creek, which is also in Oklahoma. They actually had two battles uh, at this particular site. This particular piece is interesting because it still has the, uh, the fuse, which was set to a timer, and when they fired the cannonball, then it had so many seconds, and once the time ran out, then it would explode. And inside of this cannonball, it was hollow, and it had a whole bunch of smaller, um, round balls, so these had a what they call canister shot, so a bunch of these balls were inside the, can, the cannonball and it, it did a lot of damage. This here I just found uh, uh, just last month and it, it's a, a bayonet, a Union soldier's bayonet, and uh, I found it in a, in a campsite and I actually was able to locate where the actual tent was of this particular soldier and uh, you know we dug down about a foot and just kind of estimated the actual area of where the tent was and we found the fireplace, the ashes were still there. Uh, found a couple of Indian head pennies in the uh, fireplace. Uh, then I found an old whiskey bottle in, inside of there. I found the bayonet and then over in the corner I dug a button and the button still had the wool from the soldier's uh, coat on it. And then I dug another button. I wound up digging 20 buttons out of the corner of this tent and so it was obvious that that's where he laid his coat and he he moved on to another site. He left all these artifacts uh, in the tent and uh, uh, we found them. This here, if you don't know, it probably doesn't look like much, but it's actually a, um, a Confederate officer's button off of his uniform. So it's very rare. There wasn't uh, that many of them out there and uh, it's, it's probably worth four or $500. So when it comes to relic hunting, the Confederate army, the stuff is rarer than the Union Army, so therefore it's more valuable. Uh, and they weren't as well equipped as the Union Army. The Union Army had a lot more stuff, so therefore it's more common, uh, and so it's not worth as much. So the ultimate find is a Confederate belt buckle. Could be worth upwards of twenty, thirty thousand dollars for the right belt buckle. There is a very good written record of the Civil War. Every officer with every regiment was, was mandated to turn in a report every week. Where is he? What's he doing? Uh, you know, it wasn't just a matter of them going out there and wandering around until they ran into the enemy. They had strategies and they, they documented everything they did. So these are all open to the public. It's called the Official Records of the Civil War. And you can find those. You can go to eHistory, www.ehistory.com and then click on the Official Records of the Civil War. And then you can search by areas, you know, Arkansas, Missouri, uh, or you can search by battlefields, things of that nature. Um, here's an example. Uh, here's a memo that uh, Brigadier General has uh, uh, sent to the uh, upper command, and it, and it says, uh, 
Uh, hold if possible, if necessary, I will transfer my hold force to Point Pleasant. Well, there's your research tip right there. You look up, you find out where Point Pleasant is, and um, you know, you've got the entire force that is right there. So that's an opportunity to find a lot of neat stuff. Well, it's just a very rewarding, addicting uh, hobby. It's not only rewards in, in the artifacts and the valuables that you might find, but it's just good, clean fun. You get outside, you get outdoors, you, you enjoy nature. Um, you, you're not sitting on a couch and, and you know, just doing nothing. It, it, and if you have that sense of uh, curiosity, then you're gonna like metal detecting because that's what it's all about. I, I like to think of it as kind of like a, electronic fishing. It does take patience, you know, you're not going to find something valuable every time you dig a hole. Uh, so you've got to have patience, but you've got to have that burning desire to find something good. And, uh, and when it happens for you once, then you're, like I said, you're addicted. And this is my best find to date, which is the 1715 Spanish Gold Escudo. Um, it was an ounce of 24 karat solid gold, uh, minted in Peru coming along the, the Florida coast, the hurricane sank the ship, and there was thousands and thousands of these scattered all along that area. And you know, that's where they got the name, the Treasure Coast. Uh, if you go to the Atlantic side of the Florida coast, that strip of land through there is called the Treasure Coast. And that's where it came from, is right here, Spanish treasure. The, probably the most exciting thing I've ever found. From Garth Brooks to the thousands of others hunting for treasure in America, once you start, you just can't stop. I met Garth Brooks, he came into my store um, and I was interested in metal detectors and uh, he was actually uh, digging a pond on his property, he actually lives in Oklahoma now, and uh, dug up an old coin when they were digging the pond, so like, the bug got him. Uh, he, he got interested, he came in, he bought some metal detectors for him and his kids and stuff and they just went out there and had a ball. After decades of hunting. Randy offers some pretty simple advice to those just getting started in this hobby. Spend as much time deciding and, and figuring where you're going to metal detect as you actually do metal detecting. If you just walk out the door and go to the first place you come to that's easy and, and it's very accessible and you know, you've got to figure that probably some other people have done the same thing in that same spot. So if you spend a little time finding that off the beaten path place that nobody else has took the time to research and find, that's when you're really rewarded. And that's when the hobby really becomes fun, is when you're in a place and you're finding stuff. Uh, you know, just good thing after good thing. And that's, that's done through research. It, I mean, it'll happen occasionally by accident, but, but the people that are really successful are the ones that spend the time in researching and finding out where to go. I know people that have found a single items that are worth thirty and forty thousand dollars. It's no guarantee that you're going to go out there and strike it rich. And actually, very few people ever strike it rich. But you know, just uh, I, I've known people that have bought cars and boats and and put their kids through college, all off things that they found with metal detectors. So it's absolutely rewarding monetarily as well as other in other ways. When we return, Phil Foster will share about his five-year-old son's interest in metal detecting and how owning a coin shop has its advantages in treasure hunting. Welcome back to Treasure Hunting America. Our next treasure hunter is Phil Foster, whose interest in metal detecting was inspired by the gold coins other treasure hunters were bringing into his family's coin shop to sell. My family owned a, owns a coin store and uh, we've always sold metal detectors and people would buy these metal detectors, they'd go find just these wonderful finds, they'd find coins, jewelry, they'd bring them in to me and uh, it just made me think this is something I want to do too. I started asking my father, you know, I, I need you to take me out, I, I want a I chance at this, I want to I see if I, what I can find. When Phil turned 16, a whole new world opened up for him in treasure hunting targets. When you have a metal detector in your back seat, you start looking for things to find. You know, you, you look at things in a whole different light. So w when you see an old abandoned house, it's not just an old abandoned house anymore. This is a place you might bring some treasure out. One time I found an old uh, water valve from uh, 
the Hanford Water Company. It didn't mean a lot to me at the time I found it, but uh, you know, the Hanford is a nearby town to where I live here in Fresno, and it's a neat old turn of the century valve. I don't know, you know, something like that's worth a lot of money, but it, it's not always uh, it's not always about the money. Sometimes you just find neat old things. You're always scoping for the best places to hunt. Sometimes it'll be that, that lake where, you know, where the people have been around dropping things, and other times it's a house that uh, looks like it's 100 years old. All you can see is the chimney standing there. Things that were dropped there, I mean, they've been there a long time, and you're the first person that's seen these things. Who knows how long those things would have been there if you didn't pull it out right, right now. Even though Phil was younger than most when he first started in this hobby, his five-year-old son is now showing interest in finding treasure. My son got to an age where he actually understood that there's metal in the ground and this machine will tell you that there's metal right there, you know. And I think he's kind of hooked too. He'll ask me uh, if we can go out pretty regularly now. I think he's wonder what's down there too. I think you wonder what, you know, what we're going to find today. Many treasure hunters keep most of their hoard for sentimental reasons, but because Phil's family business is a coin and jewelry shop, he views things a little differently. When I find an old coin, I'm actually oftentimes tempted to put it out for sale here in my store. We also buy and sell jewelry, so it's, I'm kind of lucky in that way where I get to just come to work the next day and, and, and turn in what I've found. Some people save it all. Um, it, it can be really neat to have somebody just lay out years worth of finds uh, in front of you. I never really felt uh, the urge to do that as much. As a professional seller and buyer of coins, Phil has some good advice if you find an old coin in the ground. When people find coins, the first instinct a lot of time is to clean them up. You know, they're covered in dirt. If you have anything rare, you're not going to want to scrub it up. It actually ends up hurting the value. Uh, collectors like them original. I'm not saying people want the coin with a bunch of dirt on it, but you, you, there are proper ways to uh, take care of coins. So you can go into a good reputable coin store, see if you have something rare, and ask them what should be done with that coin. Should it be cleaned or, or, or should it be left closer to the state it is now? For Phil, there's still a lot to be discovered, and his goals are high in what he'd like to find. Machines don't find diamonds, but they do find gold rings, and sometimes gold rings have large diamonds in them. So that, that's the main thing I'm looking for. When we return, we'll visit with Richard Brooks, who hunts old parks and finds silver and gold jewelry. A friend of mine who was working with me brought in his metal detector and he was looking for a lost item for somebody. We went out and started looking for it and he started finding coins. And to me it was interesting. I decided to stick with it. So it wasn't too long later that I went out and rented a White's 6000 metal detector. And I used it for about a week and I was hooked. What kept me going was the, the thrill of the search for looking for something that was lost in the ground. And it was more for the silver coins, possible gold coin, and the jewelry. Okay, we got a target. We'll go ahead and try to hit it here. Hopefully it's not a rock. Well, we lucked out on a piece of jewelry. How about that, huh? Silver? I have no idea right now what this is. It's got some kind of a hasp here with a, a hinge on it, so I don't know. But it is a piece of silver jewelry. I've learned that research is very important, and I've gone to the Oregon Historical Society, I go to Multnomah County Library, uh, and pick up books on the history of Oregon. Uh, they are 
priceless, really. There are places that have never been hunted. It's just that you have to find them now. The maps aren't there, the old maps. If you can find some of the old maps that go back to the turn of the century, wonderful. These are some of the items that I've found through the years, metal detecting. And uh, I'll just show you a couple of them. This is the half carat diamond ring that I've found in the Selwood parking strips. Uh, it's in very, very good condition. This is the silver eagle that was found in Washington Park uh, under a tree next to a mole trap. And it's kind of a favorite with me. That was my first real ring find. Here's one gold ring. It was found at Catlin Gable School out on the soccer field. And that's an area where there's tons of jewelry in the soccer fields. They get to play in soccer and things fly off the fingers or out of the pockets. While many hunt old parks, homesteads, or their own backyards, Richard has a favorite area most people might overlook. The favorite area is the parking strips, the little strip of grass between the sidewalk and the road. For some reason, that seems to hold very, very old stuff, coins, jewelry. I think they're loaded because people, when they get into their car or getting out of their car, they pull their keys out of the pocket, and if, there's a, if they've taken a ring off or they've got a coin in there, it's, it's gonna come out, it flips out, drops down, they don't notice it, and it's lost. We come by, we search, we find them. At this point in his metal detecting history, Richard is looking to pass on his knowledge and expertise to the up-and-coming detectorists. I don't think there can be any secrets in metal detecting. You want to pass everything that you learn as you go to the new people. We're teaching the beginners, the new people, how to do it right. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Treasure Hunting America. Be with us next time as we explore more stories of everyday treasure hunters around the country. Until next time, I'm Mark Hendricks. Happy hunting! Treasure Hunting America is sponsored by White's Electronics, manufacturers of the world's finest metal detectors. For over 50 years, White's has been building metal detectors in the USA for treasure hunters around the world. For more information, visit their website or call the number on your screen.